You are listening to the Maker's Church Podcast. For more information about our community, please visit makerschurch.org. Hey, it's so good to be together this morning. If we've never met, my name's Derek. I'm the lead pastor here. And if you're a guest, welcome. We're so glad that you've come and, and stepped into a moment like this with us. We know that all of us are coming from different places in our spiritual journey, from different uh, experiences in our life. And so we just thank you for trusting us to come and worship with us and open the scriptures and, and step into a conversation. You're actually joining us in a conversation that we've been in for a few weeks now called All Good in the Hood. And it's a silly kind of phrase that we, we, we use to, to talk about all the, 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 the different hoods. Hood is a suffix for all of the different arenas of our life that we will find ourselves in relationship to other people in. So we are talking about how to be all good in all of these arenas of our life, in our childhood, in our parenthood, in our spousehood, in singlehood, in, in our servanthood, in our neighborhoods, and all of these different hoods. And so if you joined us a few weeks ago, we started with neighborhood. And we talked about what it actually means to acknowledge and know who our neighbors are. And last week, Pastor Mark gave an incredible message on servanthood as we partnered with International Justice Mission um, on Freedom Sunday. And it was an incredible day to celebrate uh, that together we can be a part of bringing freedom in this world. And can we thank Pastor Mark, by the way, for that message? And this morning, we're going to step into what I think is, um, has the biggest bearing on all of the other hoods in our lives, and it's this idea of personhood. This morning, what I want to talk about is the very things that shape us and form us, the things that make us, us. You know, it was interesting, um, on Friday, I was at work, I work as a fireman, and we had um, a fire that most of you know about because you smelled the smoke for days on end, and if you live in the downtown area, you probably still are smelling that smoke. And um, so I was at work about 930 on Friday morning, and we got a, a call that came in for a boat fire. Um, and as we kind of hurled down market to, to, the, to the bay, we realized it was bigger than a boat. It was a ship. It was a huge old fishing vessel. And um, it's, in fact, it's a vessel that we exercise near every, every day we're at work. And we run by this boat, ship, all the time. And, and I knew going there, I said, it's, this, it's called the Norton Sound. And uh, our, our production director, Patrick Norton, I, I used to text him pictures of, hey, man, here's your boat. I knew it was going to be that boat. And um, so we get there, and we end up being the first in water supply group. And, and um, we, we labor for hours on this ship fire. And we had made a ton of progress on it about three, four hours into it. And um, we had still been fighting this, this fire, and... Um, the boat started to list because of all of the water that we were using to put out this fire. And ultimately, the executive decision was made to pull us off of the ship, um, and the only option was to let it burn. And if you're a fireman, that's like the worst case scenario ever. Because we don't let things burn. We put fires out. In fact, our level of success is that you don't know about the fires we go to because we move swiftly and we put them out. Um, but I've gotten more texts and emails and conversations this morning about what, what's that boat fire? And ultimately, the, the moral of the story is we just lost that fight. We just lost. And, um, you know, you guys think, oh, no big deal. But for a fireman, that's like, that's like not good. That's one thing to lose, but to lose publicly that big, it's not fun. And, uh, and you know, I was thinking about just that story, and I wasn't even going to tell it this morning, but so many people are curious about it. And I was thinking about how that even relates to this idea of personhood. And, and I, I, I began to realize that I cared more about losing that battle than I thought. Because every time someone asked me the, about the fire, I didn't really want to talk about it. Um, and it's amazing how different moments and different experiences in our lives have a deep and profound ability to shape us. And I think failures and losses are one of those things that, that have this propensity to begin to define us. And this morning what I want to step into and what I want to talk about is this concept of personhood. But before we go there, I want to give a disclaimer because I think that we think about ourselves a lot, to be honest. 
In fact, I think that we think about ourselves too much. I think it's a product of our Western culture. It's, it's this individualism, this idea that we matter the most. And so um, oftentimes when we tell stories, we'll put ourselves as the hero of the story. Uh, when we read the scriptures, we'll, we'll put ourselves at the middle of that text. And all of a sudden, we become David. And, and we become, you know, all of these great people. And, and I think it's a, it's a risky thing to do. And so as we talk about ourselves this morning, as we talk about personhood, before we get into that, I want to let you know and kind of give this disclaimer that this is not a self-help talk. This is not about how to be like the most fulfilled in your life or to know yourself the best or, or to have all the right language. And, and we, we joke around here a lot. We use all of those things, personality tests, gifts, spiritual gifts, assessments, all this stuff. But this is it, the riskiest thing we can do is make, this, make ourselves the center of the story. And so before we kind of dig into this person, I want to give this disclaimer. Healthy relationships are made up of healthy people. Healthy relationships are made up of healthy people. So it's an important thing that we endeavor to become healthy people. But we need to understand that our health is not for us. It's a gift that we can give to others. And the scriptures point to this over and over again. And the thing that I love about the body of Christ, this body of believers, is that when you say yes to Jesus, you move from being a person to a people. Right? You move from being an individual to a part of a tribe. You move from being a person to people. You move from me to we. And you have to see yourself in the bigger framework of that or else you will miss the whole point of what God is trying to do as he shapes us and makes us into who he designed us to be. I love that the scriptures say this in 1 Peter 2.9. It says, but you are a chosen people. There you go. You just heard you as you. You means you all. You all. He's talking to a group. Don't take yourself too serious here. But you are a chosen people. A royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Another way to say that is once you were a person, your personhood really mattered, but now you are part of a people. And really what I want to drive towards this idea is that this is less about personhood and more about peoplehood. This is about how it means to participate and belong and be an active contributing member to a body in this world. I love this, it, it, this reality that, that we oftentimes, uh, we use the excuse of withdrawing from relationships so that we can do what? Work on ourselves. We, it, it's amazing to me that we would remove ourselves from relationships so that we can work on ourselves. But the reality is, is that your personhood is only revealed communally, not individually. Your personhood is only known and revealed and experienced when it's together, not separate. And so to remove ourselves from relationships so that we can get better, it will just never happen. We need the sharpening of each other. For this, we have a culture that is so obsessed with this idea of self esteem. And we can point to our different issues in life because we have a low self esteem and we can endeavor to, to increase our self esteem. But if you know what the word esteem means, it's kind of a crazy thing. Self esteem sounds awesome, but self adoration, you would never admit to that. Like to adore yourself in any context, is just not ever really the goal. And what the scriptures say in Philippians 2 is not that we are called to self-esteem, to adore ourselves, but it's actually to lay ourselves down. Philippians 2, 3 says, do nothing out of selfish ambition. I love that the scriptures speak to this because our intrinsic corrupt self is selfish. And what the scriptures point us to is that we should do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, not in self-adoration, in humility, value others above yourself. Not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of others. 
in your relationships with one another, one another have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. This is the disclaimer this morning, that as we step into this conversation of personhood, it isn't about me, 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 I, I, I. It's about us fully knowing and understanding ourselves, becoming the best version of ourselves, not for our own sake, but for the sake of others. That we would know ourselves fully so that we could fully give ourselves away. I, I want to be clear, it is important for us to, to aim for and to hope for and to work towards becoming transformed as the scriptures talk about. We should work towards this and we've, we've structured things at this church and in all of our different relationships so that we can move each other towards that goal. But we need to understand the bigger reason why and so that we can lay it down for each other. Now this concept of personhood, woohoo, it's a tricky one. Good Lord, I, I studied this to the worst level. I, I hate getting into these rabbit dark holes of craziness. And if you Google personhood, you know that you are opening a can of worms. In fact, the, the trustiest source on earth called Wikipedia <laughs> says this about personhood. Personhood is the status of being a person. So insightful. <laughs> Defining person, personhood is a controversial topic in philosophy, in law, in theology, in politics, about the concepts of citizenship and equality and liberty. Personhood continues to be a topic of international debate and has been questioned critically during the abolition of human and non-human slavery and theology and debates about abortion and fetal rights and reproductive rights and animal rights and theology and ontology and ethical theory, corporate personhood and beginning of human personhood. Are you nervous yet? <laughs> Processes through which personhood is recognized socially and legally vary cross-culturally, demonstrating that notions of personhood are not universal. Ooh. I, I got to admit this morning that this is a topic that terrifies me uh, because I just don't fully grasp all of the arguments and all of the things and the debate around the definition of what personhood even is. And so this morning, I don't even want to go into all of that. I don't want to talk so much about the definition about personhood. There, the jury is out on that. There is much debate. There are many schools of thought. So this morning, I'm not so interested in the definition of personhood. But what I'm more concerned about and interested in talking about is the contribution that shapes our personhood. What are the things that actually shape us? Which, once again, there's a great debate about. And there's, there's so much debate over even this concept of personhood, but there, there's some, some great agreement from all schools about certain things that absolutely shape us. And childhood is one of those things. And we're not exactly sure how and to the degree of what shapes us, but we all know that childhood is a formative thing for us. And we know that, that, that in child psychology that there are, are varying degrees across the spectrum about the concept of nature versus nurture. And there, there are all of these debates about what degree things begin to influence us. But there are some things that are absolutely agreed upon that our nature, our genetics, our design, humanly, our physical attributes, those are things that are passed on to us. They are part of our nature. But there's this more elusive part of us, this this spirit part of us, these emotions and feelings, the soul is this thing that we aren't quite sure about yet scientifically exactly how we're shaped. I mean, we know that my son looks like me because he came from me. But we have no idea the bearing that I will play as a parent in his life. And the craziest thing is parenting. 
You, you, and we're, we're not going to tackle parenting this morning. That's a different conversation for a different time. But as I began to, to kind of wrap my head around this, knowing that, that my wife and I and you as a community are going to play a role in shaping my children, it's a terrifying thing. Because no matter how hopeful we are or how intentional we are, we're going to screw it up. Because we don't quite understand exactly how it all works together. But we know that nature and nurture, that it's this big ball of wax that you can't separate from each other. Just the other day, we were driving somewhere and my son said, Dad, are we going to be on time? And I was like, yeah, we're going to be right on time. And he said, cool, so we're going to be early. (laughs) And I was like, no, we're going to be on time. He's like, well, then we're going to be late. And I was like, no, son, we're going to be on time. It starts at 8, we'll be there at 8. And he goes, Dad, early's on time, on time is late. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> you never listen to me. And you listen to that. <laughs> like, he didn't just listen to it. He embodied it. He, like, made it his own. And he was so matter-of-fact, he wasn't even being argumentative. It just was settled in his brain that if we were on time, it must mean that we're early. And if we're going to be on time, well, then we're late. And the craziest thing is I started, like, tracing all the wiring of this. I'm not even a guy who, like, appreciates being on time. (laughs) I am wired to be late. I am not. Like, all of the assessments, all of the personality things say, Derek, you're late. Everything points to that. However, we can become the products of our environment. I work in a career where we show up to relieve each other at work an hour early. Who does that? We don't even get paid for it. It's just a cultural expectation. Shift change is at 8. You get to work at 7. And if you don't, watch out. You become labeled. You become, in fact, uh, i got to tell you, I've been a 7 o'clock guy my whole career. Been on the fire department almost 12 years. And I value that. I've become a part of that. It actually, the environment, I was nurtured into changing my ways. Good or bad, I don't know if that's good. Am I not being me? Am I me? Is it a better me? Is it mature me? I don't know about this. We can be so confused in those ideas of personhood. But I know that I've become a 7 o'clock relief guy. Until my son started going to school down the street from my firehouse and can't get to school until 7.15. And now I take my son to school on the way to work and I get to work at about 7.20, 7.30. And to be honest, I just, I feel like an absolute failure. It's it's actually become a point of contention in our marriage, in our family. Um, I'm mad at my son if he doesn't get out the door early enough because I carry this burden and this pressure of not being there on time because there are certain frameworks and certain reputations that get told about you. And there's a lot to just being on time or late to somewhere. And as I think about what I'm even doing in my son, I'm like, is he wired for that? Is he not wired for that? Is this a good thing to nurture? I'm like, this poor kid's ruined for life. He's only six. (laughs) And And then I had this other experience last week. I got mandatory at work, which means I, they just said you can't go home. It was a Sunday morning. Worst case scenario for me is to miss church. And I was at work on Saturday. They said, hey, you're stuck here on Sunday. Thankfully, Pastor Mark was already preaching, and the team was fantastic without me. But I love being here. Uh, but it was also a challenging Sunday because my wife, Laurel, worked at like noon, and I was supposed to take the kids home from church and spend the day with them. My son had a baseball game at 3. And I'm like, man, there was so much to organize. Thank you to Jackie and everybody else who, like, babysat kids for hours. And uh, Pastor Shalise was so kind to take my son to his baseball game. And I thought that what was a horrible situation got turned into something really beautiful. I was really celebrating this idea of family and people rallying together to take care of each other. And uh, Shalise and her fiancé were like stand-in parents at the baseball game. And Shalise grew up playing baseball at the field they were playing at. And it was just, it was like this beautiful thing. I loved it. I loved knowing that in my absence that we had a family that was so big. In fact, I posted a thing on Instagram this morning, or the, the next morning, speaking to that. What a great thing. And then about an hour later, I got an email from his coach. And he said, hey, I just wanted to update you. Um, 
Blake was, um, he was a little off yesterday. And I really think that he's a different player when you're not there. And um, I think it really matters when you're here. And basically started shaming me for not being at my son's game. And, uh, you know, I don't know, Shalise wanted to kill him the next day. <laughs> Laurel sent him a picture. You guys are all getting defensive. <laughs> and while it's probably true that I'm a way better coach than Shalise is, um, <laughs> Man, that hurt deeply because I was the kid who never had his parents at my game. And I swore that when I grew up that I would always be at my kids' games, that I would be an involved parent, that I'd become a dad that was committed and dedicated to my children. And so this part of my history, it kind of reared its ugly head at me last week, and it cut deep. It cut deep and there, was, there were labels that were put on me and there were stories being told about me that I had to decide whether or not they were real or not. And, and if it, and if, thank you, I agree. <laughs> but how, how do you get to this place where you know who to listen to? How do you get to a place where you know which voices to trust? And which voices to dismiss. And the most difficult thing is it's not always those voices out there that are most difficult and damaging to us. So many times it's our own internal narrative and dialogue that can shame us the most. And the reality is, is that we are all born into a story. And there's a, a moment in our lives where the story is being written on us and it's being imposed on us and we have absolutely no bearing on that. The environment that we're raised in with the parents that we're raised in and the community and culture and context, it's all something that we don't get to choose. As a kid, I didn't get to choose to have my parents not at my games and at the time, I felt like they didn't love me but later on I looked back and I realized that they were providing a roof over my head. And that they were doing something that was more loving than showing up to my games. But you don't see that when you're a kid. And it, it damages you and it, 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 there's trauma associated with that. But the reality is, is that we're being written on for so much of our lives as we're children. The story's being written, but eventually we will pick up the pen. And we will continue to write the story. And the reality is, is some of you were born into loving homes with parents who loved you and cared for you. And it was an incredible experience growing up. And you're still damaged. And others of you, you grew up in the most broken home with so much abuse and so much betrayal and, and so much bitterness. And some of you have turned out damaged and some of you have turned out just fine. See, the, the amazing thing is, is that while this story is being written on you, that eventually you will pick up the pen. And even if you grew up in a great home, you get to choose the story that you will write after that. You can pick up the pen and you can write a story of gratitude. You, you can write a, a story of grace where you are grateful for all that you were given. Or even if you grew up in the best environment ever, you can write a story of self-indulgence and greed. Entitlement. Where everything should be yours. Others of you, you grew up in the worst environment ever. But somehow when you picked up the pen, you began to write a story of forgiveness. Where bitterness and anger wouldn't take root in your life. But others of you, that brokenness, it broke you so much that because you were hurt by others, you decided you would hurt others. And what we realize is that the story is not only being written on us but we are writing on the stories of other people's lives. And the, the things that shape us will inevitably be used to shape others. And so how do we find ourselves in the place where we can know who to listen to, to know what to trust and what to dismiss, what to believe and what to deny? And that is what I love about the scriptures. I'm going to be honest, I think that for most of my life, I approach the scriptures the wrong way. In fact, 
I don't think that just childhood is one of those things that could damage you growing up. I think religion could damage you tremendously. And I think that we've been taught certain things about the Bible and about God and about the expectations that he has on us that could absolutely damage us. But when you step into the scriptures and you see them as the bigger narrative, as the bigger story of God interacting with us, we can begin to learn the way God sees us, what God has to say about us, and to begin to shift our narrative. We have to place ourselves in the right story so that we can begin to understand the fullness of who we are. I love that that the scriptures, they point us to truths like this. We can see the way God interacts with Jeremiah. In Jeremiah 1.5, he says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. By the way, that, that was written to Jeremiah, not you. Don't put yourself in the middle of that story. But that is the very same God that we serve. And if God would see Jeremiah like that, what would keep him from seeing you like that? If God could see Jeremiah like that and God had a plan and a purpose marked out for his life, what would keep God from having a plan and a purpose marked out for your life? What if we could get to the place where we could respond to God because we know what he says about us. We know that at the first breath he designed us in his image and likeness. That before anything else is said about us, that we would know that God designed us to be an image bearer of him. That he loved us so much that not only did he design us and make us, but he breathed his life into us. The same breath that he used to speak the world into existence in this beautiful poetry that talks about where we came from. is the same breath that breathes life into us. And the same breath that we can use to speak life into others. But unless we understand the big story of God and we see ourselves in the middle of it, we will get the story wrong. And we'll believe the lies that people say about us. We will believe our self-doubt and our self-talk and the things that make us last. But what if we could respond like the psalm writer in Psalms 139? For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. Do you know that? Do you know it? Do you believe it? Have you heard it enough to buy into it? To bite off on it? i got to tell you this, just coming to church on Sunday, well, it's not enough. It's not enough for you to hear it because we're not talking about this every Sunday. But you know what the scriptures are constantly pointing to? This idea that God speaks. That God is speaking. That he's longing to continue to be the dominant voice in your life where you can learn the way he sees you and the worth that you have in this world, the plan that he has for you, the purpose that you have. But if we don't place ourselves in that story, if we don't see ourselves in the bigger narrative, we will be doomed to less. And I love that John gets this as he writes the opening of his book. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He says the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Do you see what's happening? The very nature of ourselves and the very nurture, the environment, they came together. The word of God became flesh and dwelt among us. What was natural and what was spiritual became inseparable. That you are both body and body and spirit, and your soul is being shaped by something. Your soul is being shaped by someone, and God is longing to be the one who you allow to shape your soul. Your beginning is that you were made in his image 
and likeness. Your now is that if you are in Christ, you are forgiven and redeemed and reconciled. And we're moving towards the last word where all things will be made new, be made right, where shalom, where that very peace and, and connection with God will be restored and renewed, where things once again will be all good in this personhood. You were designed to live in relationship with God, to live intimately in communication with him. And I believe desperately that it, it starts with knowing how to hear his voice by seeing the way he interacted and spoke through in history. And I love that we are connected both to a history and to an eternity. And what the scriptures point to is our history as a people. It doesn't just talk about God's activity in humanity. It talks about humanity's response to God. The scriptures are a story of a murderer named Moses, a liar named Abraham, a prostitute named Rahab, a liar and a murderer named David. The scriptures tell the story about how God stepped into human history, into the nitty gritty, into the chaos and reshaped and reformed and reclaimed these very broken lives and used them to bring about life and purpose and meaning in the world. And if God could do it in the life of Abraham and Isaac and David and Rahab and through all of the losers that were the apostles, so broken, ridiculous, asinine when you read the Gospels. He used them? Then I think we can get to the place where we can actually begin to believe that God longs to use us. Man, our self-talk and our self-doubt, so many times it's the loudest voice in our heads. But I believe that if we step into the story of the scriptures and place ourselves there, that we will begin to see that those things simply are not true. It's in the scriptures where you will discover that God views us and he says things like you are his masterpiece. You are his workmanship. You are established. You are clean and holy. You are saints and priests. You are forgiven. The scriptures point to these labels that matter most to us that come from the very pioneer and perfecter of our faith who puts all shame to death. And here's our biggest problem. We can hear these things said about God and we believe it. God says, I'm the light of the world. You go, ah, I can see that. And then he says, and so are you. And we got issues with that. I know better. I know my own brokenness. I know my own sin. I know my own self. We can look at the scriptures and they point to God and they say, he's clean and he's holy. We say, I get that. God, I know you are, but what am I? And he looks at you and he says, you're clean. You're holy. You're worthy of my love. And in your sin, came for you. In your brokenness, while you were still sinners, I came for you. I pursued you with my love so that you would begin to know and sense and see and hear that I am simply not finished with you yet. God is longing to be the dominant voice in your life. Can you hear him? When we step into the scriptures, we hear his voice, we can replace these thoughts about ourselves with what he says about us. When we say, I don't like myself very much in this moment, the scriptures say, I'm loved. When we say, I feel like an absolute failure, I'm not gaining any ground in this battle, the scriptures say, you are more than conquerors. When you say that I, 
I'm losing confidence. I, I don't think I can do this anymore. The scriptures say you are strong and courageous. When you say, I don't know if I can fix this part of my life. It's too broken. The scriptures say you are whole and complete. And when you say, I don't know if I could ever be forgiven for this. The scriptures say you already are. And so what if, what if our personhood could be so shaped by what God says about us and less shaped by what we say about ourselves and what others say about us, I believe then we'll have the very best of ourselves to give away. You are listening to the Maker's Church Podcast. For more information about our community, please visit makerschurch.org.